All right, now we can talk with Emily Simmons, general counsel, about, about the bill that we brought her in for, <laughs> we asked her to come in for, which was S-16. Uh, you realize we're dealing with 16, uh, 13, 14, 15, and 16. Um, which has had our heads spin, spinning just a little bit. Um, and wanted to get your feedback. We had a, a presentation from Wendy Geller that dealt with a lot of the, uh, a lot of data information and um, Representative Brady is, is kind of being our, our lead on this. So she was gonna be working with, I believe, Jess DeCarolis, and I think it was you, Jay, correct? Did you get? I think it was Jeff Fannin, but I did uh, write to Representative Brady and said if she needed help with the yeah. suspension expulsion language, but I really didn't want to help with the data collection language. I trust the AOE and what they, yeah. they know about that. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to review, she's going to review that and get the work with Jim Damaray to get that language sorted out in the bill. And I guess we were just going to ask you a few questions. And one, I think that I had from you, unless you had a presentation, Jim presentation, no. The task force in section two. Um, we were wondering where the task, I was wondering where the task force came from and uh, your thoughts on the task force. Sure, I'd be happy to give the context that I'm familiar with, especially as it originated in the other body. Yeah. So there were two ideas for a bill and a bill that was introduced as S16. The bill as introduced focused on that data that is collected and that maybe should be newly collected by the Agency of Education around discipline in schools and around protected class of students and the disparate impacts on those students and discipline. The agency, separately from the development of S16 by its sponsors, submitted some ideas about changes that we feel are warranted for serious and I'd say truncated study to recommend legislative action to you about our statutes on suspension and expulsion of students. So there's two uh, complementary, I'd say, but two sources of the language you have in your bill now before your committee started making any changes. So they, those were the data elements and the study of data through a task force. And then really coincidentally, the agency's proposal to uh, institute a task force to make recommendations for very targeted changes at what we actually do, what we actually require in the statutes for what happens to students who are subject to discipline. So now they all, all that those two concepts live together happily under the roof of S16 that you have before you now. So the task force that the secretary recommended what had a sort of, I, I came up with the idea thinking that there was some low hanging fruit in our discipline statutes and it was probably way past time to look seriously at prohibiting suspension and expulsion for all students except for some very, very narrow categories of student behavior. And I was primarily focused on the idea that through the Gun Free Schools Act, which is a federal piece of legislation that we have to retain the ability to expel a student who brings a serious weapon to school under certain circumstances. So starting from there, the idea was there's probably not much else that we, after working with this task force, would identify to still be legal grounds for suspension or expulsion, but that we had some stakeholder work to do. We weren't ready as the agency to come with legislative language that we'd want you to pass tomorrow that that should be subject to a good transparent stakeholder process and a report to you with valuable information and a recommendation. So the secretary was um, asking to choose a, a task force 
to work with from among a list of characteristics such as please include special educators, families, teachers, administrators, groups who do social justice work in schools. And it was to that level of detail that our proposed language over on the Senate side started with, you know, secretary, work with people who fit these characteristics, come back to us next year very quickly with legislative language about the, the language is still in the bill, um, several tasks, and we can go through those if you want to, but they were the real, they were the real doing aspects as opposed to the data. So that's why I know it was a point of discussion in your committee last week. Why does this task force look different? Why aren't the names of organizations and their executive directors or designee used? It was the agency's proposal to Rather than name uh, the people we lovingly call the usual suspects, the V's, to have the ability to look more broadly at individuals who might not be associated with those advocacy organizations who have an interest in that stakeholder work. The, the Senate Education Committee changed the language a little bit when they put the data ideas and the statutory changes ideas together. Okay. Do you have a problem with it being the way it is? A, a little, <laughs> and it's nuanced in how I would say this to you. And I think you know me well enough to know that this just comes from a, a friendly place of observation mm -hmm. and I'm not pushing hard on this, but we have a habit in our community of legislators and the field, the agency, the V's of naming really hardworking advocacy groups to every task force that we come up with, every committee, every study group. And I have wondered, as I have done more of this work, how that looks to folks who don't regularly work um, in this room, <laughs> in this room, um, or within those advocacy groups, whether that looks like good government, best government practice to name specific groups or to be in the habit of always naming the same specific groups. So I was excited when the language survived through the Senate where just more general group of people based on their interest or their work or their expertise generally were named because I thought maybe we can prove that this idea works and that the agency can be trusted to pull in a diverse group of people to work with and prove through the stakeholder process and writing a report that that, that can work. But if that's not how you're comfortable doing that, I'm not gonna push. Questions? Comments? Okay. Committee, do you want to keep it the way it is or do you want to change it back to where the, the way the Senate did it, where the secretary was doing the appointments? Or do you want to keep it that we are having the groups appoint? Can someone remind me um, how the, the list language, whose recommendation that was? I'm sorry, I've lost track of the it came up in a conversation it in because it came up in conversation because we noticed that the secretary was appointing everybody and it was a different way of doing it. And we went, wow, that's really different. But we didn't ask why. We just went ahead and did it. <laughs> Emily Simmons, yeah. I, I prepared for today by going back and listening to your conversations last week. It was while you had the ACLU in and um before that testimony, someone else that day from the Best Institute had said, we would love to be involved. Yeah. And then the ACLU said, we would love to be involved. And then you had the conversation about, well, let's put them in there. Yeah. So then we started making our list. Mm -hmm. Representative Austin. Yes. Um, I, again, I always look at outcomes. So I, you know, I would tend to look at what skills and knowledge do people have to have to be on the task force to effectively have the outcome that 
that is desired. Um, so that's kind of how I would look at it. Representative Brady. Um, <clears throat> I would still err towards where we have it spelled out more. I do still worry overall, it's too many. <laughs> this is a giant task force. And if you see how well, we're struggling as a committee to get things worked out. Um, but I think some of the specificity in here, maybe beyond the Vs, which I think we need some of their just institutional knowledge and expertise on some of this, but are we're naming some folks that are not sort of usual suspects on, you know, the best project, the Vermont Family Network. Um, there was a different restorative justice group that, that I was hoping we might include. Like, I think there's some representation here, the Vermont school counselors that are not our kind of typical suspects on all the task forces, but are gonna have enough of like what you're, you're talking about, Representative Austin, of some background and expertise on this that they come and we're asking for, especially if we don't change the date, really quick turnaround. So there's hopefully a little bit less need to, there's some, something gained by people who are used to working in this process and can then hopefully do it a bit faster than if it's a more sort of citizen based group. My other concern about it would be that if it's a much more sort of broadly sort of citizen based group that the AOE is putting together is, does it draw from people who have very particular individual experiences um, that then that's their reason for wanting to do it, which is a good thing. However, if people are really narrow about like this happened to my kid, I saw this one thing in one school, um, is it bringing together more anecdotal experience, but doesn't give us the kind of breadth of knowledge that particularly, I think there's, there's some really interesting, thoughtful people included in this list. I will say overall, I'm worried about how long the list is still. <laughs> Representative James. You know, I'm for this time around, I, you know, I think convinced by what Rep Brady said, but I, I am really intrigued by um, Emily's comments about, you know, best practices and the creation of, of these lists that we always do and whether we always tend to go to the usual suspects. And um, I, I just, I wanna give that some thought in a broader, in a broader sense. Um, it, it's really interesting to me, it's not, something I'd thought about. The only thing I'd been able to crystallize in my you know, first few years in the legislature was that feeling of perpetual shortcoming about trying to come up with the perfect list and how it never seems, you know, it kind of never seems like we're really getting there. Um, so, you know, maybe there is a, a totally different way we need to go about this. I, I'm not sure right this very second is the time because this is sort of a more interesting list. <laughs> than our usual list. This is what would it look like if we did like a, a, a compromise, if we had some of these spelled out and we left a certain number of spots for the agency to fill, does that, but I, I understand the concern you're expressing, Emily, and I, I'm new to all of it and clearly task force are like, we create a lot of tasks. I have a concern about how many task forces we create, but uh, but if if this one was populated sort of in two ways, with us putting some particular expertise there and giving the AOE some discretion to field it, with or does that just sort of make both groups unhappy? I don't know. What does that seem like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, good question. I'll, I'll take it as a question. It, I could have taken it as just like an interesting thought and nodded, but I'll jump. <laughs> so you could, I could imagine that you state a, a number, not more than, and, and the group shall, you know, there are some of those um, groups that share characteristics, like they represent um, school administrators, or they rec represent community groups. You could try to bucketize and give a maximum number for the whole task force. You could bring it down from 20 and say there must be at least one who represents each of the buckets. But if I say any more, I'll get myself a, a piece of drafting homework. So I'll stop there. That's just what I was thinking. 
you read my mind. <laughs> Came dangerously close. Yeah, you, you might have crossed the line. <laughs> um, Emily Simmons, would you mind drafting some language <laughs> that might take into account what Representative Brady's saying? Yes, I'll do that because I know that you all will just absolutely go after it. Um, it'll give Every you something to respond to. So there's very little pressure on me. You can just <laughs> edit it to death. <laughs> Representative Austin. Yep. Just quickly, um, again, working, having worked in the schools and looking at the work of the Howard Center or NFI, you know, their work worked. I mean, the kids they work with in my school, in, their behavior improved and they were able to acquire the skills. So again, you know, I'm not saying those agencies, but I think we need to be looking at what works, you know, what has some track record of working when it's implemented. I think um, pa Patty Tomashot said about um, uh, restorative practices, if it's done with fidelity. I remember she, she really emphasized that point. Um, so, Again, you know, we, I, I think we all want to do what's going to work for these kids because otherwise they'll be in jail, you know, if they don't learn how to regulate their emotions or delay gratification or uh, manage their behavior, they're, they're headed for real trouble. So, um, you know, hopefully we want the people on the task force that can advise us as what works to help these kids. Others? Okay, uh, Representative Brady, it would be great if you could, um, I've given you quite a task, um, pull that together. Do you want Jesse to try to set that up for you? And it might mean a little time out of committee. Uh, yeah, she started an email chain and, and okay. we'll get going on it. But I wonder, do we need to, involve Jim and all of them, or should I get a few things worked out? I, I'm worried there's a few, this is gonna be a more than one step process. And so I don't wanna waste Jim's time or not yeah. pull Jim in until we're all, everybody else is got their I, stuff. I generally find it really helpful to have him in the room. Okay, okay. Um, because right. he has a very often has an ability to just go boom. <laughs> okay. Okay. And uh, he's definitely helped me in the, at those times when you know okay. just kind of going off like this. He's an ability to sometimes pull it back together and put it into sentences. So um, alternately, in the new punishment instead of suspension could be you have to figure out how to make all the different changes of this bill work together and right. instead of any expulsions or suspensions. That will be the, write that on the board a hundred times. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, so great. That, that's only yeah. a punishment for legislators. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's also been a little punishment for Emily Simmons too. When we ask her, yeah. and, and then we just completely ignore it. <laughs> Representative Austin, I just wanted to ask Jay. I think I I might have misunderstood, and I think I spoke to a representative, Chair Webb, about this in terms of suspensions and expulsions. When you send a child home because they, they're not behaving, they're being disruptive, you have their parents come and get them. What is that called? If, it's, if you're doing it for disciplinary reasons and it's not part of the kids, the child's plan, yep. then it's typically a suspension. It is. Because uh, you're, you're, it's a, suspension, a cessation of educational services. So you're taking away that kid's fate for a, for a period of time, their free and appropriate public education access for a period of time. Okay. So a lot of people try to get around that, but I That's really think it you got to call a spade a spade. Thank you. Okay. Yes, please, Ms. Simmons. I, I had a request, and I really don't mean for the agency to double team this bill. And yeah. I knew that you were asking me to come in to answer some specific questions, so I didn't prepare testimony. Um, but I did give the bill another scrub and there's an aspect that I would request that you either rethink or maybe this you've thought about it and this is exactly what you mean to require and I'm just unclear. On page 12, which is section four, 
specifically on lines nine through 15. You have a direction for the Secretary of Education and the State Board of Education to directly incorporate the task forces recommendations for practice changes and for new data collection um, directly so that the chain of authority is that the task force makes a decision about a recommendation or a new data collection and the agency and the state board are supposed to do that period. That's highly unusual that you would vest a task force with the authority to direct a state agency without that coming back to you. Right. Um, you almost always see a report and find it very persuasive and then direct us, it's fine. But as the agency's general counsel, I just have to protest that really, that really big um, step on our authority as state agencies operating under the law. So right now we have shall incorporate. <laughs> That's strong language. Yeah. And on, page, on line 14, I have a feeling that the districts might also object because we would then be required to require them to report new data that is not current practice. And I'm not saying we would never change our current practice. We just usually would take our direction from the General Assembly. So they need to present it with, okay, homework? <laughs> what would you say? I would, I actually would recommend that you strike section four. Um, well, you need section 4A, so it's section 4B that you would strike in its entirety. Okay. So it leaves it with it says shall collect and distribute to the task force, but does it say anything about what you do with it? So, oh, yeah. So section 4A is where the agency is collecting and distributing information to the task force. I would recommend you keep that, yeah. but then I would recommend you strike lines nine through 15. Is there a place where it gets reported back? Where someone has to look at it? Emily, would you mind repeating why you, you would recommend um, striking section B there? What that language does in the shall adopt and shall require and everything in between is just related describing those two actions gives the task force the authority to change the data that's required for the field to report, change the rules of the State Board of Education, change the internal practices of the Agency of Education. Yeah. So do we have recommendations? <laughs> So there is a report, there is a report, page 10, lines 16 through 21, and it goes on to the next page. It's E is where you describe the report back from the task force to you. Okay. Okay, so you don't know where that language came from? can tell you I didn't ask for it. <laughs> okay. Um, Jay Nichols? Um, I wonder if it's appropriate. I'd asked about this earlier and we talked about when Emily came in. Um, section six around the suspension of students, sus suspension or expulsion. Um, that's on page 13, Emily. We have recommended that the language be amended in there to say that that would also apply to schools that are receiving uh, public dollars. In other words, private schools that are receiving public dollars. Currently, it only says public education. And so I, I know the committee wanted, wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Okay. 
Okay, so we have two important statutes on discipline and they don't treat approved independent schools the same. One of them, and I don't know if you've discussed it or not, is just about discipline generally, and it's 1161A. It describes a policy that every district and every approved independent school has to have, and it describes the minimum elements of the policy that I think in the most pertinent part um, requires some description of minimum due process that will be afforded to students before they are suspended. And that might even be, as, as you all talked about earlier, just the student leaving school for, for the rest of the day, that would count. Um, so the policy should articulate what due process the student is entitled to rather than, you know, the statute doesn't set the standard for due process, the school does. So the approved independent schools are required to have a policy that complies with 1161, which has a lot of pertinent information and I'd encourage you to review that. But then 1162 is where the minimum amount of due process is stated. That's only for public schools. So that requires a public school to seek the approval of the school board for a suspension of more than 10 days. And that's where you get the ability to suspend a student up to um, 90 days and then we start calling it an ex expulsion for 90 days or until the end of the year, whichever is longer. Um, and the behaviors for the behaviors that can cause a student to be suspended or expelled are outlined for public schools in 1162. And I know you looked at that because your bill is amending 1162. It's adding a new section onto the end of that. Um, if the question is whether you have authority is Jay's recommending? Yeah, I think you do. Um, the distinction of students who are publicly funded at approved independent schools, I think that's just totally a policy call, but I'll point out that every approved independent school has to have this overriding discipline policy. And it, the policy applies to all of its students, not the publicly funded students only. Anything else? Let's see, Representative Conlon. So Emily, just, just to clarify on that point, we have the authority to just say private schools without saying publicly funded or approved independent schools, as opposed to saying only those students who are publicly funded at an approved independent school. Yes. Okay. Representative James. Um, so I guess I'm not, I guess I'm not um, clear on whether we feel like we would need to hear um, quickly from independent schools on, I, I feel like we would. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, it seems Rep. Brady, I have not given you a small task. <laughs> and it, it will probably likely it would require uh, missing a meeting, um, given your time, given time. If it would help Aaron, I'd be happy to follow up on the private school or independent, approved independent school issue. Great, are there um, any other issues? You know, I support I support it philosophically, but I also don't want it to derail the bill. But um, I'll uh, I'll reach out to the head of the organization. I think we know what the answer will be. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And um, would you like someone else to? Do you think Representative Conlon, you you could also just help Representative Brady along the way on this one, just to be a, a backup? No. <laughs> Ron yeah, I'm happy, happy to pitch in where I can. <laughs> Thank you. Representative James. Thanks. I, I wasn't sure, um, as long as we have Emily here, whether um, she could provide in, any 
feedback on my sort of overarching, uh, the overarching concern I raised earlier, which is that nationally, it seems as though LGBTQ students also suffer uh, from higher rates of exclusionary discipline and suspensions. And that doesn't seem to be addressed in this bill and whether we should and ought to and how we could do that in a succinct way. Um, um, we talked about that a little bit earlier, Emily. I don't know if you were watching our conversation earlier, but um, it, it seems as though national stats bear that out, um, but we don't really mention that in the findings, and I, I don't think we have the Vermont stats um, that we need. And remember, why don't you um, update her on what Wendy Geller had said about that, too, unless you already know. <laughs> what her concerns were, what are the challenges were in it. Yeah, um, so if I'm summarizing correctly, um, what Dr. Geller said was that we are under Act 1, or when we collect information on hazing and bullying incidents, for example, we're, we're gathering information not necessarily on like the LGBTQ status of the student, but on what happened during that incident. So if somebody was called a slur or hazed or bullied for being gender non-conforming, we have that information as part of the what happened. Um, whereas if a student who's, I, I think I'm understanding this correctly, whereas if a student who is you know, LGBTQ, for example, or gender non-conforming is suspended or disciplined, we don't necessarily have that information about them. And is it like a, you know, is a privacy problem? Yes, so I think I, I it seems so important to get out to me, but I, I don't I don't know how we do that. I'm not aware of any data collection at the agency where other than the school climate survey, potentially, where it is collected as a as a function of school government to ask students to identify themselves as LGBTQ plus or none of the above. Right. I don't I question whether we want to do that. Yeah. I question whether we want the the state to have um, that database. Yes. But that's not your question. So I want to respect your question. Well, but I want to respect your response. So <laughs> that, I mean, yeah. So anyway. So um, I, I do know, and it sounds like this is also what Dr. Geller told you, that when we are working the data collection about HHB, hazing, harassment, and bullying, that the information about the target is not the collection, the behavior is defined as harassment as opposed to bullying if the behavior is motivated by the protected class status mm -hmm. of the target. And the data collection is totally focused on the harassment, not the harassee. We have processes that are focused on the target and making them whole in the HHB policy and procedures, but the data collection is its own animal. And that is a federal collection. So we abide by the feds rules for what they want. And we, as a general rule, do not collect more information at the agency than we need, either because we're required to by you, by the federal government, or by one of our programs. And I think that's good ethical data practice. Wendy's our expert on this, but I, I think thought experiment, and it's a scary one, flip around in 50 years, the people who work in government now change their identity according to how you want to imagine this thought experiment and ask yourself, do you want those people having all this data about our students that we don't know that we need. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And I, and maybe we need it, but I, I just always ask myself that question. So to make you feel better and not to leave you out there hanging, when the agency proposed to take some action to quickly work with a stakeholder group and come back to you next year with new language for the expulsion and suspension statute, we really didn't feel we needed to see any more data to know it was time to make those changes. Didn't need to see any more data to be convinced that we should reduce the behaviors for which a student can face exclusionary discipline. Mm -hmm. that, that's been the theme for us, that 
we want to have we want the public to have the data they feel they need for accountability and for advocacy and all all of that good work. But when it comes to changing the statutes and really bringing down the level at which we can um, suspend a student or raising the bar for when we can suspend a student, we didn't need any more data to be convinced that it was it was time to do something. Would it um, would it just put this on the radar to add? I mean, I know <laughs> findings. Uh, you know, I, just to add a finding. I think that's what findings are for, right? I think that's a great idea. I love findings. I know I know not many people like findings, but anyway. All right. Um, thanks. There might be something in the in the um, exclusionary edition of the discipline support that you could find. Mm -hmm. Okay.